Awesome, thanks. Um, so welcome to the 2022 Groundfish Seminar Series. We are recording this and an MP4 file will be posted on our webpage at the Alaska Fishery Science Center um, in about a day after this presentation. This is the seventh of nine weekly Groundfish seminars running through December 13th. Since we are doing this seminar remotely, the speaker will use an electronic pointer or be descriptive when indicating specific points on the slides. To help with this format and avoid additional distractions, please mute your audio and turn off your video feed. Also, please keep your questions for the end of the seminar or type them in the chat box uh, and Sarah and I will compile them. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind people to join us for our next speakers, Cheryl Denton and Adam Cook from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, who will be talking about the Canadian Inshore Lobster Trawl Survey, a lobster-focused multi-species trawl survey in the eastern Gulf of Maine and the Bay of Fundy. And that will be held at the same time next Tuesday, December 6th. Today's speaker, Richard McBride, has worked as a fish and fisheries science scientist from the Gulf of Mexico to the Gulf of Maine for almost 40 years. He has published more than 80 papers on the biology and ecology of marine fishes. He is a former associate editor for the journal Transactions of the American Fishery Society and is on the editorial boards of the journal's Fisheries Bulletin and the Bulletin of Marine Science. Rich received his BS from Eckerd College, his MS from Stony Brook University, and his PhD from Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey where he earned degrees in biology, marine science, and ecology and evolution, respectively. He has held two postdoctoral positions, first at the Florida Marine Research Institute as a research scientist, and second at NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center as a supervisory research fishery biologist. At the center, he is in charge of data driven a data-driven branch that collects, processes, and interprets biological samples, contributing to stock and ecosystem assessments in the North Atlantic Ocean. Across NOAA's Fishery Science Centers, which is a founding member of the MARVLS group, which is Advancing Research and Application of Fish Maturity Assessment, Reproductive Variability, and Life Strategies. And he is one of the leads for the NOAA Fisheries Strategic Initiative on Genomics, where he contributes his knowledge of biogeography to eDNA metabarcoding studies in the Atlantic Ocean ecosystem. So thank you for joining us today, Rich, and go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much for that introduction. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Great, great, thank you. Very happy to be talking about fishing for science today. I'm gonna definitely highlight some of uh, the benefits of enhanced biological sampling, which is what we call when we work with fishing partners. I think a lot of people know that we have some longstanding survey, particularly a, a, a 50 plus year uh, bottom trawl survey that we use extensively for monitoring, assessment and management. Uh, but these, this is an example this, this actually two fishes are examples of what we have to do when the bottom trawl survey isn't enough to refine fish vital rates for assessment and management. And I do want to say, point, put up front, I'm going to layer in a, 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 some parts of stories for two different fishes, Atlantic halibut, an important flatfish in our area, as well as Atlantic wolffish, another ground fish area. I'm going to highlight in this slide the the principal investigators that I partnered with on this, these two projects that were funded by the Salt and Stahl Kennedy uh, uh, program, the NOAA funding program, Chris McGuire with the Nature Conservancy and Elizabeth Fairchild of the University of New Hampshire. But there's also other individuals, many people that I, I need to acknowledge for their contributions. We worked very extensively with the cooperating, our cooperating fishing partners who not only put us on fish, but shared their knowledge in helping us with the sampling design and in many cases, actually uh, process the fish as part of the arrangement. Uh, for example, with the halibut, fish, the halibut fishing, we worked with the Cape Cod Commercial Fishing Alliance in particular, and their scientists, George Maynard and Rachel Marshall. And with the wolffish sampling, uh, we worked extensively with Captain Jim Ford uh, in the Stellwagen Bank uh, uh, sanctuary area. We had many other fishing partners with the states of Massachusetts and Maine, 
uh, both commercial fishermen, fishery independent surveys, working with our centers, um, study fleet, and and we did we did include fish that we collected on the bottom trawl survey, and you'll see how that kind of blends together. Uh, other people to acknowledge or many, the many people that worked uh, to get the fish to the lab, worked with us in the lab. Um, Scott Elsey with the state of Mass for the fish aging, and Mike Curso Sula uh, in state of Maine, and obviously our funding aid program I mentioned before. NOAA Fisheries Salt and Stall Kennedy program, very instrumental in getting um, the samples that we need uh, through directed partnership with the fishing industry. So I don't want to, I, I want to combine these two stories. I think a lot of us think about how important it is to manage fish sustainably. And we're often doing that by trying to leave a st spawning stock biomass out there that's sufficient to have free fish in the future. Um, in many ways, I learned this lesson about fish reproductive potential from the fractured fairy tales that I watched in the Bullwinkle and Rocky cartoons um, in, in, in my childhood, particularly the story about the goose and the, that laid the golden egg and how it's so tempting to kill that goose to get all the eggs that are in there, when in fact, actually really the benefit of letting a goose lay a regular egg is really what, what we're trying to do often uh, to ensure fishing for today and profitable fishing for the future. And the example I'm gonna show kind of contrasting, I mean, there's a lot of arguments in the assessment world about whether it should be 40% or 30% S spawning stock, bio, virgin st spawning biomass. I'm going to talk more about the data that we collect to actually use those estimates to get at a sense of what size and what age and what complications are there to estimating those parameters in the uh, in in the data stream. Let's begin with talking about Atlantic halibut. Um, I think uh, it, it's shown it's shown here occurring on both sides of the Atlantic from Russia and Norway uh, in the east all the way to uh, North America where there's stocks in Canada and uh, the US. Uh, many, many people may feel, may, may be recognized there's also a Pacific halibut. Um, many of you may be out on the West Coast. That's true. And both of these overall are doing quite well in terms of their being valued at millions of dollars a year. However, the US is not sharing that equally with the can Canada. Canada has very high landings, much, much higher orders of magnitude higher than what's uh, being landed in the U.S. areas. And the status is very different by country. In the U.S., there's no analytical assessment that's working. The ground fish survey, for example, barely catch it, has a signal that's above the noise, and uh, it's managed only as a bycatch fishery. Whereas in Canada, you couldn't possibly have a more contrasting example where it's uh, certified by the Marine Stewardship Council. So this presents some very interesting examples about uh, of a fish to, to, to learn more about. And just getting some basic bio, uh, life history information is a good place to start for the US population. I'm not gonna get a lot of, into the detail of all the different samples, but the, these different symbols, symbols indicate where we collected the, the different fishes. Um, all the way out on the northeast peak of George's Bank, uh, concentrated fishing off Chatham, a, a fishing community off uh, Cape Cod, here with these dark circles, um, sampling throughout by the, the 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 federal surveys, different state surveys, a longline survey in the middle of the Gulf. We sampled, you know, as broadly as we could in the Gulf of Maine to get the samples we needed. But what really helped. As you can see, the benefits of the Salt and Stall Kennedy Award that was uh, granted in, in 2016 allowed us to really jump up. We had previously been sampling only a few dozen fish by the Northeast Fishery Center uh, bottom trawl survey in yellow, and that was pretty consistent across the years, but we needed more samples, and we were actually double, more than double, almost triple our sample size with working with others, in particular the Cape Cod Fishermen's Alliance, uh, sampling extensively in 2017 and, not, and 18. And it's not just the raw numbers, um, it's, it's particularly for reproduction 
um, where the, the maturity state of a fish can change radically from one month to the next, it's very important that on the, as it's shown on the right, that these samples helped collect in the winter, not, not March per se, but also extensively in the summer, which helped us bridge our, our regular sampling in the spring and the fall bottom trawl survey. So really the fishermen absolutely made a difference, not only just grow, you know, large sample size, but actually the timing of the samples. So for example, we were able to look at the size and age with very good sample sizes. We settled on the section otolith method, not surprisingly being more reliable than the whole section, the whole um, otolith. And we were able to show here in the red are the females and the blue are the males that not surprisingly for a, a flatfish that the females get larger uh, in, in terms of their asymptotic value uh, than the, the males. However, very distinctly with these large sample sizes, we felt, felt very comf confident in concluding that we were seeing size and age truncation as the fish gets much larger um, and much older, decades older than uh, in Canada. Um, Something I'm not going to talk about a great deal in this talk is as I want to focus a little bit more on my specialty of reproductive, bi reproductive biology. Shown here, looking at something as simple as calculating a gonadosomatic index, which is a relative ovary body weight to formula is there in the uh, upper left, indicating that it's a ra ratio of the gonad weight to the ovary free body weight. And you can see each of these points is a, an individual fish you can see there's a breakout in the spring where these fish start getting larger gonads and very again showing how rapidly the gonad weight ratio to the body weight can change in the season so we're show, we're looking at developing females here and interestingly we didn't have a lot of samples collected in december and that kind of leaves the question of where where you know it looks like they're the fish are getting to be spawning at this time of year Fortunately, I mean, life history in, in, in our samples only were able to show so much as we were na not able to actually collect any spawning fish. But we do know from tagging study, a, um, uh, a, jo a joint partnership that was part of this study uh, that was the, anal the data was analyzed by Chang Lu uh, in IC's Journal of Marine Science is showing the, the path, the, the spawning migrations of two different fish here and uh, I'll enhance this with some um, monthly progression of the fish as it, uh, one individual fish, you know, was collected in the northern Gulf of Maine and, and swam uh, during the fall and, and into the winter, swam down to the, the northeast peak channel, northeast pan channel up to depths of a thousand meters. And also another fish during, shows a fall spawning migration sampling not only down to that same area for um, but is shown coming back in the spring so we have some evidence in the gulf of maine that they they do these spawning migrations and they're very difficult to collect uh the spawning individuals during this time there's actually quite an extent i was at the flatfish biology conference uh, a couple of weeks ago saw some very exciting data from canada showing these similar patterns of deep deep water spawning migrations, actually showing some fine scale information outside the and inside uh, in the, the, the mouth of the St. Lawrence, uh, uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence, indicating spawning rises by individuals. Um, so there's, there's um, some very exciting compatible data. And I think the tagging data is gonna be very, very exciting to compare to the life history data that we're collecting together. So we we wanted to do more with just our, our surveys that are going out to sea and being able to identify and understand what we're looking at when we look at the, the gonads. These are showing three pairs of gonads, the ovaries. Ovaries are a paired structure in most fishes as they are here in for Atlantic halibut. As you can see uh, a fish that had this, these blue bars are one centimeter increments. So you can see the gonads quite small for even a fish that's large as 70 centimeters total length. Uh, you can see they, the gonad grows generally with the fish growth, but even for a fish that's uh, well over a meter, almost 160 centimeters and 11 years old, uh, a fairly modest sized gonad 
uh, with a GSI of only uh, less than 2%. We match these up, for example, in, in several cases, we match this up to what's going on inside the gonad. These pictures that I've added to these are indicating the gonad histology, actually showing this the advance of the cellular structure of the germ cells in t inside these females. So you can see this one in, in uh, on the left is has only the primary growth oocytes shown here, very condensed grape light structure of the gonad lamellae and um, indicating that it's an immature fish. Here, this fish is actually breaking out with uh, germ cells entering into the uh, cortical al alveol alveoli. Uh, this this uh, distal ring of dark spots actually is used for to prevent uh, multiple sperm from fertilizing an egg. But this is actually indicating that the fish is going to spawn maybe in a few years, so it's immature but maturing. So this is very distinctive that the gonad's getting fairly big, but it actually shows no evidence that it's going to spawn in the current spawning season. Not until you get to a, a fish that's well over a meter do you actually see mature ovaries indicated by these larger, much larger cells and this concentrated uh, yolk that's here in the cytoplasm surrounding the nucleus, um, indicating that this fish has actually entered the late stage of vitellogenesis indicated here as V2. Um, we also noticed skip spawning. Uh, it was, we have some preliminary estimates on this. This was indicated here as an individual, for example, above uh, one meter in length collected uh, in October when fish should, uh, uh, fish at this size uh, should actually be um, entering vitellogenesis, showing vitellogenesis when in fact actually here, this picture showing here, of it, it, it actually doesn't have oocytes that are more advanced than the cortical alveolar stage and it has a very thick gonad wall indicating that it has spawned in the past, the gonad is stretched out and reconfigured uh, after a spawning event. So we're able to identify say immature fish shown up here at the top as those with thin gonad walls, thin lamellae, very uh, tightly clustered primary growth oocytes as fish that have not spawned and are not gonna spawn anytime soon compared to mature fish that have spawned in the past and but are not spawning this season. It's mature skippers. So we can go back to that simple information of the GSI and actually add more information by looking at the most advanced oocyte stage that was found in the individual fish. Again, we see those developing females ramping up uh, starting in the spring and ramping up through the summer and the fall. These are the late cortical LV, uh, the late uh, vitellogenic oocytes. The vitellogenesis is a process that is associated with yolk production um, and maturation of the oocytes. And uh, down here, there's kind of bumping along uh, with fish that are immature, resting and skipping with very low GSI values. So, this, this leads us to a proposal reproductive life cycle for Atlantic halibut uh, that we worked out in partnership with the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, showing that there is all, all fish are immature at some point and they pass through a functional maturity stage that puts them in a spawning cycle of developing, becoming ripe, spawning as running ripe, uh, becoming a spent condition and re recrudescing in through a resting and developing period. But also we were identifying, although our numbers are fairly imprecise and preliminary, we were able to identify that skipping was was definitely seen in the populate in the samples that we were looking at, although and and, and at, at a low rate of perhaps as low less than five percent, but in another sample as high as twenty five percent. I think this is something we want to really continue because this suggests a disassociation of the mature versus the spawning stock biomass. And I think the life history information that we continue to sample these fish will be helpful, but also it'll be very interesting to see more information come out uh, and the tagging information that people are doing with pop-up satellite tags to help define the, so the difference between mature and spawning stock biomass in Atlantic halibut. 
I'm going to come back to Atlanta Cal a bit um, in a minute, but I want to kind of start weaving in sort of a different uh, but uh, useful story about Atlantic wolfish distribution, landings and biomass. It's it's distributed on both sides of the Atlantic, shown here, um, with wide distribution along Canadian waters and the Grand Banks, and into U.S. waters in the Gulf of Maine. This pop this fishery was actually very active um, as re as recently as the 80s, 90s, and the early noughts. However, declining spawning stock biomass, um, well below the threshold level of a simple assessment, uh, led to a prohibition on possession of Atlantic wolf fish. However, since then, uh, there's been an into uptick, and you can see when you see this kind of an uptick coming approaching the SSB threshold, you know there's going to be a lot of scrutiny as to exactly how precise and how um, accurate you believe your estimate of the, the L50s, uh, the, the, the spawning stock biomass. And so it became very important as we approached this threshold that we were very confident about that. So we went out and sampled more Atlantic uh, wolffish uh, not quite as extensive and on this other side of the Hague line in the Canadian waters, but extensively enough to sample the Northeast peak of George's bank, the Southeast channel throughout the central part of the uh, area. There was some sampling by the study fleet in this box and sampling extensively in the Stellwagen bank area with fishing permits, uh, for Jim Ford, uh, showing, um, showing this picture here with Dr. Fairchild on the back deck of hit one of his boats. Again, working with the industry really helped us to increase the sample size and the monthly coverage um, sampled extensively. Uh, we had been sampling with fairly decent numbers since 2009, we had accumulated a fairly decent sample size. But as you can see on the, the, uh, the right here, we, we only really had samples from the spring and the fall. And it was very, very difficult to really understand the full reproductive cycle without kind of at least bridging this summer gap. So that's what we focused on in 2017 uh, to get fish from all the different uh, months in the summer from late spring to early fall. And we were very successful in cooperating with partners uh, who had the knowledge and the means to get us the fish. This allowed us to look, for example, again at the growth of the fish. You can see these fish get quite big. Um, and actually, in this case, there was dimorphic growth, but the males are larger than the females. Uh, the the Gompert's growth equation fit better than the uh, the von Bernalfi growth equation in particular. Uh, but uh, uh, something that was very interesting to see that the 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 dimorphism, which in this case probably has to relate to the, some of the peculiar spawning patterns. There's internal fertilization, there's nesting, there's brood guarding. Um, this is a, a very a very complicated courtship and, and mating system for this fish that probably has to do with the, the dimorphism being with males larger than females. Focusing on the reproduction, uh, looking again, looking at seasonality, we were focused uh, we see the, G, uh, the gonad somatic index being very low in the spring, climbing steadily during the summer, peaking in September, starting to uh, show evidence of decline and post-spawning activity, uh, certainly by October and November of the year. What I, I wanted to focus on for this fish is to show, is to show evidence of abortive maturation whereas there was a very strong difference between physiological and functional maturity in the, in the spawning season. So these are showing pictures, of, macroscopic pictures of two different fish that were collected in the fall, and they both have vitilogenic eggs and their oocytes in their gonad. However, the one on the left, a much smaller fish, had a, G, a very small GSI, and the, the maximum oocyte diameter was about one millimeter. In most commonly in broadcasting marine fish, one millimeter egg is, is ready to, uh, uh, an oocyte at that size of one millimeter is ready to go. Um, however, again, this is a very peculiar fish. It actually shows um, maximum oocyte diameters 
much larger, four millimeters in diameter. And so a functionally mature fish in the fall would have a GSI value as a whole number in double digit values. Um, and obviously you can see the picture. These are just very different uh, gonads uh, in terms of size between these two. So we wanted to look under the hood and see what was going on. And it turns out that there are a number of individuals in the spring of this female is shown, one of them is shown on the, the left, has an advancing yolk clutch of oocytes for a fall spawning event. However, these females, some of these females are, by the fall, are resorbing that clutch of yolked oocytes, ex showing extensive atresia by the asterisk, um, red asterisks um, throughout the lamellae. And the less advanced oocyte stage, the cortical alveolar stage three, as shown there, are the ones that are going to actually um, advance and spawn in the next year. So this indicates, and this was not just um, massive atresia uh, evident um, in the fall, it showed that they, the individuals that were showing this abortive maturation were statistically and biologically meaningfully smaller than those that were mature and ready to spawn in the year. So probably an energetic consideration as they start maturing, but they don't have the energy to fully um, develop the, the cohort of eggs to spawn in the fall. And so they pull back and they spawn in a, a later season. That puts in terms of their life cycle, a physiological maturity that may not lead to functional maturity right away, may lead to abortive maturation cycling back one or more years before the individual becomes actually functionally mature um, and then develops into this spawning cycle. We did see one skip skip spawner in here, but uh, which amounted to about a 5% part of the mature females. And so we, we documented that skipping occurs for Atlantic wolffish as well. I want to shift and kind of bring it back together to ask you know, sort of to simplify it, having this much more detailed information about the reproductive biology allows us to, to proceed more confidently with what we're calling immature and what we're calling mature in terms of a simple binary response uh, in terms of size or age at maturation. So you can see where we draw the line here slightly differently for the two different fishes. And if you haven't seen this, I'll walk you through very quickly in a set of four slides how this works out in terms of plotting the mat proportion mature fish at, at different sizes. We first, these indicate these tick marks on the top axis indicate the size, uh, the fish size of mature fish that we collected. Here on the bottom, we're collecting uh, the, the size of the immature fish. And with a, a logistic transformation of the generalized linear model, we get this sigmoidal curve that indicates there's a lot of maturation happening between 100 centimeters and 150 centimeters. In particular, if we look here for Atlantic um, halibut, uh, we can make a point estimate. Uh, the median size at maturity is 130 centimeters or 51 inches. So this fish is actually maturing at quite a large size for the first time. And of course, people are always interested in com our confidence in estimating that. Uh, in this case, between 125 and 135 centimeters was our 95% confidence limits. Uh, in this case, done by bootstrapping. So let's talk about how we could use this information first for Atlantic halibut and then for wolfish. Since Halibut is a discard fishery that presents a very interesting proposition um, in terms of that's what we have. That's the kind of information we have to look at to evaluate the population. We can monitor with this new information on exactly what the L50 is, which was poorly um, represented for our, our region. We feel confident that we can monitor the proportion of females, mature fields caught each year and showing here the proportion above that that um, L50. These are indicating sample sizes. The density is indicating that they're getting more fish 
uh, and as the years go on that are mature, that are above this size, as, and there's also indicating the density of samples that are below that size. And you can see a very steady increase in that proportion from below 20% to uh, uh, something like 50% as, they, as they're going forward. And this is very popular in the fishery that uh, the bycatch is becoming more readily common. And although there's various ways you can interpret it, in a data poor situation, this is something that's very useful to monitor and will be going forward in future assessments to uh, if you can assume some constant rate of recruitment and uh, no ev you know, and evidence of uh, consistent uh, grading at sea, this is a very positive sign that the fish are getting bigger and perhaps actually getting, um, actually reversing the uh, trend in size and age truncation that's evident in this fishery. We can also, you know, do the same kind of maturity estimation for the age. In this case, again, indicating one of the hurdles of trying to rebuild Atlantic halibut is they're not, they're not maturing until they're almost 10 years old. How may this information be used with Atlantic halibut or Atlantic wolffish? Excuse me, I get my fish mixed up from time to time. Um, slightly different story back in 2007 when the uh, moratorium on pro, uh, the possession of fish was being considered. The macroscopic evaluations of maturity were all over the board because we didn't really understand the abortive maturation, its effect, and, and, and how to diagnose it at sea. And so the response by the assessment biologists at that time in 2007 was to estimate the sensitivity of, of having different lengths at maturity from 40 to 75 centimeters. And they didn't know necessarily, we didn't know which one, which was correct, but you're seeing in terms of sensitivity, you're getting everywhere from below 30% SSB to even above 40%. So definitely shows the need to actually measure this with more confidence and with more precision, using gonad histology allowed us to do that, um, and we came up with an L50 of 50, uh, about 53 centimeters, but somewhere between 49 and 55, 95% uh, confidence limits. And this is used going forward in the 2020 stock assessment, which allows for more reliable catch advice uh, when you when you can say you 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 know the number with some comp, which much more confidence than we have in the past, and also just interesting on the biological note, uh, in terms of the A50, the fish aren't maturing until they're almost seven years old. Something somewhere between 50, uh, six six and seven years old is the 95% confidence of the A50, and that seems like uh, again a slow growing. Uh, late maturing fish, but that's not bad for a fish that lives deep in the Gulf of Maine, basically its entire life, less than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So in terms of conclusions, uh, in the Northeast US, one of the most data rich systems in the world, there are many data poor species still uh, that we're having trouble catching in our standardized sur surveys and whose management would benefit from improvements just to simply basic life history information. To that end, um, both of these studies recently were published. The Atlantic Halibut paper is now published in the most recent issue of the Journal of Atl Northwest Atlantic Fishery Science, and the Atlantic Wolffish study has been published in the most recent issue of Marine and Coastal Fisheries. Very good experience working with both of those journals. Fishermen have skills to get more data into stock assessments. Um, in, in this case, it was very interesting. It, uh, while it presents the challenges of getting meetings together uh, and uh, issuing exempted fishing permits and the oversight, uh, this would, engagement leads to shared understandings and new insights. And certainly, I, I think we're all very pleased with how the sample sizes were, were, were very much what we needed uh, as could be delivered by the fishermen. We also work closely with the modelers. I think going from the, from the at sea collections all the way to the final analysis, Dan Hennon, uh, who's the lead assessment biologist on Atlantic halibut and Chuck Adams, who's the lead assessment biologist on um, Atlantic wolffish, uh, to deliver the data in the form that they could use 
uh, so we could both learn about how they use it in assessment and actually contribute to the assessment itself. Um, I'll leave my NOAA indication, my, my NOAA email there, as well as the two PIs on the project, Chris and, and Elizabeth, and I'd be happy if there's time, looks like there's time to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks for the great talk. I'm, uh, I'll be here fielding some questions in the chat or feel free to virtually raise your hand and ask the question yourself if you would like. We have a bit of time. Usually it takes a few minutes. Sure, sure. I'll put up these um, also information on these two publications too. Oh, great. Okay, we have a question in the chat from Paul Spencer. Could abortive maturation be considered a form of skip spawning? Yeah, I'll answer that broadly to say that it's probably driven by a similar process of the energetics and that it's it's where a fish is trying to mature, trying to advance a clutch of eggs for spawning, and it just doesn't have the energy. And um, it's either uh, aborting the maturation as, as something as dramatically as was observed in Atlantic um, wolfish, or it just it it it's um, it just doesn't advance a clutch after it's spawned in the past would be another skipping. The main difference, and it, it is important in terms of where it fits into the life cycle, is abortive maturation is is resulting in a delay of first maturation, where skipping, as it's been defined in the literature, is indicating is where a fish has spawned in the past, but um, is not spawning in this particular year. So in that sense, they are at different po points in that life reproductive life cycle, uh, which may be important in terms of how, how the information is being used. Paul Spencer says, gotcha, thanks. Uh, we have a couple of other Great. questions in the chat. One from Sandy Sutherland, who says, hi, hi Paul. Uh, okay, are the skipping halibut smaller than others? By and large, the general rule is where there's sufficient data, you see that the skippers are generally the smallest and the youngest fish that are that have just matured. And there was some indication of that in our data as because those the skippers were largely age nine uh, for Atlantic halibut, but there were only there were pretty small sample sizes. So I think that's a good general rule, and I think it was probably happening in Atlantic halibut, but um, we really struggled to get really large numbers of mature fish, and so I'm a little cautious by uh, about saying exactly yes, but probably. And we have another question in the chat um, from Pony Shoot. Are the skipping fish in poorer condition than the non-skippers? Right. Right. In general, that would be true because something like condition, like the the body weight, in general, or the or one of the organ weights such as the liver weight, where energy is stored, often leads to something like skipping. This has been pretty well documented in winter flounder off Labrador, where they they actually have skipping rates pretty persistently. Um, as high as 25%, um, and they're they're actually also not surprisingly they also mature very late in their life compared to more southern stocks of winter flounder. I don't think we were able to show that specifically for Atlantic halibut because our information our information on condition was was not very thorough. I mean, basically, you know, when you're dealing with fish that are often over than a meter long. Uh, the prospects of getting reliable weights at sea are a little bit tricky. Uh, so not the best example to prove that point, but in, by and large, skippers are going to be in poor condition, either measured grossly as they say the Fulton K 
um, or more precisely with one of the energy with some measure of one of the energy in one of the organs. Okay, another question from Sandy, and I'm sorry for my pronunciation of your last name, but Nidecher, maybe? Um, she said, just wondering about initial contact with industry and how these projects developed. Yeah, I was really fortunate to have um, partners come to me. Uh, you know, we, we've been working on reproductive biology, Mark Winchell and his team have been working at, you know, in the Northeast Fishery Science Center. And for example, for the halibut, Chris McGuire had been doing some very exciting tagging work on cod and wanted to start doing tagging work on Atlantic halibut. And they and he decided um, he struck up relationship with the Cape Cod Community uh, Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, and out of that grew the life history study, um, as we wrote up the Salt and Stall Kennedy program. So. Um, and and the same happened in in similar ways with Elizabeth Fairchild. She had worked very extensively with uh, Jim Ford and and his fleet uh, in the Gulf of Maine on Atlantic on Atlantic wolffish in the past. And the, she and I were talking about how we would I I really needed samples from a different time of year, and I needed someone that was partnering there. And I think it's really critical. I mean, it's it's easy to say that it's, you know, we'd like to partner and there are benefits to partnerships. But actually, um, I know George Maynard gave a talk at the recent Flatfish Biology Conference, and I think there's an abstract for that that's that's out there floating around from a couple of weeks ago. There's just a lot of actual setup that can really benefit your project in, in terms of bringing on the fishermen, finding out what they know and how, how involved they want to be um, and the more involved they can be, you know, th there's a lot of benefits to that. Sometimes they just want you to ride the boat and get the fish. Um, I, I think in these cases, the, the fishermen were very in invested in getting the fish. Um, we did go meet them to uh, teach them how to uh, take the life history samples. That was a very specific event. Um, I wouldn't say that they just knew how to do it, but they were remarkably good at taking otoliths out of fish that were as big as o over a meter, and they knew where the gonads were. And so, with the, the you know, with that kind of prep work and training, absolutely, absolutely, it was a very good experience for both of those studies. Okay, great. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat or hands raised virtually, so let's just give it a minute or so. Oh, wait, I, sorry, I failed at scrolling. There are other, give me one sec. Sandy said, gives me hope, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Go get him, Sandy. <laughs> And then Chris McGuire said something in the chat, but it, it doesn't seem like it's a question. It seems like it's a response to Sandy. Um, anybody else have any final questions? Okay, so Chad Keith said, these are great case studies of how working with commercial fishers can be so beneficial. Thanks, Rich, and all others that have worked with you. I'm not sure if you stated this, but the sensitivity analysis for L50 sizes for Atlantic wolfish were based on data from various geographic regions, Cape Cod to Iceland. This is a great improvement on the 2007 assessment. Yeah, that's good. I, I remember working with Chad uh, way way in the past. He's, he's moved on to a different position, but he was very involved in the wolffish assessment. And yeah, those numbers that the the bracket between 40 and 75 centimeters just didn't come out of thin air. Um, but then again, it, it really shows the point that okay, they 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 spawn it, they they mature at different sizes off in Iceland or in Canada than they do in the Gulf of Maine. Well, we want to use our information that's local and regional uh, for the Gulf of Maine. So that was, you know, I mean, it's fine to sometimes borrow information from a neighboring population, but this shows you actually it was 
uh, the numbers can be quite different uh, for your for your particular population and are worth investigating directly. Okay, well, that seems like everything in the chat. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and uh, sounds like really interesting and important work. Um, thank I you for inviting me. Happy to have you and I think that concludes the uh, groundfish seminar for this week. Please tune in next week uh, at the same time. Thanks so much, Rich. All right, bye bye.